cute, quite marsupial features. And I think it's, um, <laughs> I think they're just lovable looking, aren't they? Mm -hmm. They're kind of like very lovely babies. Mm -hmm. And I think that the main thing about the teenagers is they're very rarely, well, they're not very masculine. Mm -hmm. So um, my husband says David Cassidy was basically a girl, but mm -hmm. he was very androgynous. And I think these are kind of a transitional love object. It's kind of something, mm -hmm. you know he's not going to climb out of the poster and ask you to do anything bad, don't you? <laughs> There's a great line in the book where you talk about how it couldn't be somebody like Mick Jagger or David Bowie because they would ask you to come, they would ask you to do, do something. Do something, yeah. We well, don't didn't know what. No. But you knew your but mother you knew wouldn't, you wouldn't have, it. have it. No, exactly. <laughs> exactly. Yeah, I mean, it's, it, as you say, there's sort of this blank screen that you fill with all your longing. Yeah, yeah. I also think as well that people said, is there a difference now with um, what? Evie's generation is, is loving these kids. I just think that my daughter's bedroom, I don't know if anyone's got teenage children here, but it's basically like the control room at Cape Canaveral. There's kind of iPods and computers and you know gadgets and electric pianos. And, and, and my life was fantastically boring. Mm -hmm. um, in South Wales in 1974, we had the kind of, we had the little cassette player, really tragic looking back, you know, <laughs> with the kind of horrible cassette tapes, which always broke. Uh, and you had the radio. Mm -hmm. And I had an old dance set play, which would be my mother's, you know, with a kind of leatherette on the bottom and a kind of cream top. And like about four records, one of which was The Sound of Music. So you just, you knew everything. Every picture you had, every magazine you had, mm -hmm. loom was so much more important. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Uh, I think the kids now have got so much. Mm -hmm. I still think the romantic obsession is there. I just think it's somewhat diluted. Yeah, because they can be distracted They from can be it. distracted from it. It's interesting, you know, I think it's also important that girls have teen idols because I mean, you know, all the statistics show that girls mature a little faster than boys and things. And I think they're filled with all this yearning and all this love. And the boys are not yet worthy of it. And they need some place to put it, right? Yes. Like they need a... Oh, that's, I hadn't thought of that. That's a very good theory because people often ask me why it is. And I think, no, 13-year-old girls don't want to go out with 13-year-old boys, do they? <laughs> <laughs> That's very good because they're about two years behind, aren't they? Yeah, and they're not ready for the adults, right? So you, you, you write about the longing, such longing, oh, you know, that such, they're filled. Such longing. It's, I, I do think, I mean, people talk about puppy love and it's this kind of bubblegum shallow thing. I, I, I think it's quite extraordinary. I think it's, it amazed me when I came to write it that it hadn't really been written about mm -hmm. because it's not only is an amazing personal force, it's a huge commercial power. Mm -hmm. Cassidy had 30 million fans. Yeah, before the internet, which meant we were all filling in the little coupons and doing the stamped addressed envelopes and stuff like that. And watching the one TV show when it aired once a week. Once a week. And that was that. Yes, yeah. yes. It's really interesting, too, because longing is kind of an underrated component of love. Mm -hmm. You know, we, we sort yeah. of, it's all about ending the longing and finishing the longing. And, and, and this is a period in which you're allowed to indulge. Oh, yes, endlessly. Yeah. Yeah, I think she says in the book, unrequited love, the only kind that lasts, doesn't she? <laughs> Um, but I think that, um, yeah, I, I, I've thought a lot about it. I've asked myself a lot about what is it that makes this period incredibly powerful. And I think it's the dress rehearsal for adult love. Mm -hmm. But I also think that women go on telling themselves stories about love through their lives. Mm -hmm. And I think we just do it, novelist or not. I think we're all novelists of our own love lives. And I think there's that, we, we rather enjoy that thing about, you know, is he going to call me? Did he say this? Did, what did you think of that look? You know, and I think mm. it's extraordinary. So I think, I think we are natural narrative spinners about love, don't you think? Oh, yeah. I think that we can play an answering machine message back in the day when there were such things over and over, over and listen and for every for nuance. Nuance, and yes. And some guys just rung up and said, you know, do you fancy dinner? And it's kind of like, oh, <gasps> what do you mean by fancy? <laughs> what do you mean by dinner? <laughs> you how did he say you yes did he say it like that <laughs> yeah i mean you say it's it, their pop idol is there when no one else is they help you grow up and they give you someone to love who can't hurt you it's so interesting that you add that because then you know your heroine in this book petra goes on to be quite hurt by men oh, and does. and and yet she kind of holds this idea of love yeah can you talk about that a little bit? Like what, you know, how, how these, I, I think in some ways these experiences of unrequited love that don't hurt us kind of sustain us maybe in some way through the... Yeah, well, I was wondering because the second part of the book, she's, she's in her late 30s. She has a teenage daughter of her own who has Leonardo DiCaprio posters on the wall, which of course she's very annoyed about because they're ruining the paintwork. So she's become her mother really, but she's, uh, her husband has uh, gone off with someone much younger 
so she's hurting in all kinds of ways. And there comes an opportunity to revisit the past, doesn't there, too? Mm -hmm. um, she finds the letter telling her, when her mother dies, she finds a letter telling her that she has won this trip of a lifetime to meet David Cassidy on the set of the Partridge family, which the mother has hidden. So it's been sitting in this box for 24 years. And it's a kind of oh, you know, turning point. And if she hadn't been deranged by grief for her mother and for her marriage, I think she would have just left it. But mm -hmm. she thinks there's a moment where she thinks, what became of her, that girl, if the girl who filled in that quiz so carefully with her Talmudic knowledge of David Cassidy? I, she says, I want to go back up those stairs and I want to go into that cold bedroom and I want to give it to her and I want to say, here you are, darling, take it. Mm -hmm. Because she remembers how painful it is. And it's painful. All my female friends, when I told them what I was writing about, said, I would not go back to being a 13-year-old girl for a million pounds. You mm -hmm. know? It's hard, isn't it? It's, it's so interesting to me how much it informs who we are today. It doesn't matter how successful you are, how many glittering dinner parties you have, how many fabulous friends you have. I mean, I am that girl from a steel town in Pennsylvania. I imagine you are that girl from I am, Wales. I am that girl, yeah. Do you feel like a perpetual outsider still in the middle of your glittering London life? Yeah, hence I'm, I have no glittering London life. But, <laughs> but yeah, of course, because I'm, I'm a sad novelist rather than the, you know, I'm not the movie star, am I? I'm, <laughs> tomorrow I'm going to go to the set. I don't know how she does it. I'm going to be like hiding behind a kind of post, you know, lamppost looking at Sarah Jessica Parker. Um, yeah, of course. Of yeah. Course, you're right. Yeah. Yeah. Because but I tell my daughter when she had, you know, because there's a queen bee in my novel. And it was very funny when I wrote it because throughout the novel I had called the queen bee what? the name that my queen bee was called. And I got to the end, I thought, we can't call her this. But I was really struggling to give her another name because she was the only person who was so vivid to me. Mm -hmm. And Petra says in the book, I don't know if anyone's had this experience, that even when she grew up, women, perfectly nice women she met with this name, she felt an instinctive recoil from because such is the kind of fear or, or dread. Mm -hmm. um, and people told me things that I put in the book, like someone had said that they had their queen bee and they'd saved up all their pocket money to give her a special gift, which would appease this girl's wrath and power. Like the virgin in the volcano. Absolutely. Yeah. So go and place the offering. And she'd bought this Mary Quant, which was big in those days, Mary Quant eyeshadow kit. And, uh, you know, the girl had accepted it graciously. And then a few days later, the, the, girl, the girl in question had found another girl who the Queen Bee had passed on the Mary Quant eyeshadow kit to. So she just found, she just discarded it. And that to me summed up that feeling that, you know, just, you know, doomed to, doomed to kind of be excluded and things. And yeah, I think it, it shapes her life to some extent because Petra marries someone who's very charismatic. She's a, she's a cellist. She marries a very charismatic musician who isn't a better cellist than her actually, but she adopts the, what does she say? Um, yeah, she says, I'm a cellist. She said, doomed to play second fiddle to my husband. So mm -hmm. that's the, mm -hmm. she says, that's what I am, second fiddle. And she accepts that role. And I think maybe all of the kind of turmoil we find at the beginning of part two. And I think she's kind of ready. You know, when you go back to reunions and people say, oh, whatever happened to such and such? And it's like, she thinks, whatever happened to me? So part two is really about her. Mm -hmm. trying whatever to, happened to me. Trying yeah. to free that sad child from her chrysalis, I think. I have a bunch of more questions about the book, but at first I'm going to take a small diversion into a more general yeah. topic here. I, I just want to throw out this phrase to you, chick lit. And I want you to discuss this idea personally infuriates me that, you know, any story about 50% of the population of earth is dismissed as <laughs> yes, chick yeah. lit, but I yes. want to know what you think. Was it, was it Garing who said, when I hear the word culture, I reach for my pistol, but I hear the word Chicklet, I reach for my machete, really. Mm -hmm. What can you say? It's uh, patronizing. Um, it does infuriate me when you spent kind of six years in your room fashioning paragraphs to, to get them as perfect as you can to reflect the feelings. And trying to create a world of a 13-year-old girl is not easy because everything you want to put in, everything you know, you can't put in because you'll spoil the illusion of it being the child who can't know everything that you want to put in. So it's mm. just... I went back and I read Catcher in the Rye, I read To Kill a Mockingbird again. I was trying to learn how did they do that. Mm -hmm. So if you're spending that much effort and time doing it, mm -hmm. uh, you think at the end of the day, and then it's called something disparaging. Mm -hmm. um, but it's okay, because it's not. 